All right, so we're here today to talk about uh, deploying Kubernetes on bare metal using the cluster API. Um, so who are we? My name is David Watson, and I develop hybrid stack solutions at Samsung. And I'm Jason DeTiberos. Uh, I currently work on cluster API mainly, but also some other SIG cluster lifecycle related projects for VMware. So to go over what we're going to talk about today, we're going to go into a little bit of the background of why we sat there and uh, tried to, what we need to do to extend cluster API to be able to work better for bare metal environments. A little bit of the uh, motivation of why we did that. Um, some, we're going to dig into why we chose initially to try admission webhooks, show a little demo, and then we're going to come back to um, custom webhooks and then the future of cluster API. So first for the background, what is cluster API? So it's a subproject of SIG cluster lifecycle, and you can get this directly from the uh, cluster API page itself. It's a project to bring declarative Kubernetes-style APIs to cluster creation, configuration, and management. It provides optional additive functionality on top of core Kubernetes. So we're not trying to create something that is part of core Kubernetes itself, but we want to build on top of Kubernetes to be able to bring that declarative style management for actually managing clusters. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is you have a user, they provide some declarative config, they pass it to cluster API, and at the back end you get a cluster. And ideally, you'd be able to create clusters across uh, various different cloud providers and various different infrastructures. Um, so the declarative API is made up of four different types. You have the machine, the machine set, the machine deployment, and the machine class. And to help um, show you kind of what each of those do, um, we like to create an analogy to actual other Kubernetes objects. So a machine is similar to a pod, it's the base unit. Then you have a machine set which can manage multiple replicas. Uh, the machine deployment, similar to a deployment, is being able to roll out or roll back a state change to the, uh, a set of machines. And then a machine class is sort of similar to a storage class in that you can take some set of the configuration and share it between multiple objects. So how do you take that declarative config and you know, actually get a cluster out of it? So Cluster API provides a common controller manager to manage the machine deployments and the machine sets. There's nothing provider specific there. Um, on the provider side, each of the providers right now has to provide their own controller manager that you know, takes care of uh, cluster actuation and machine actuation. They do that by generally vendoring in part of the cluster API repo to provide the actual controller functionality, and then they implement their own actuator interface on top of that. And that's the part that is actually provider specific and interfaces directly with the infrastructure APIs that they care about. Okay, so now we'll move on to the motivation. Uh, so we've talked about what cluster API is. Uh, and now we want to talk about bare metal and why we think changes are necessary in order to adapt the cluster API to the various bare metal environments that exist. All right. So one of the uh, big issues that we have is that bare metal infrastructure varies widely. You have all different types of um, bare metal machine provisioning. You have MAS, you have um, digital rebar. Uh, in some cases, uh, some companies don't even have any automated provisioning. In those cases, uh, sometimes they'll have pre-provisioned machines that you want to take out of that pool and leverage for that reason. Um, on top of that, you also have other types of infrastructure that you may have to interact with, and there really is no standardization within a lot of organizations on what those look like. So you could have various different load balancer providers. If you want to be able to integrate on the uh, firewall side as you enable uh, ports between different components, now you're looking at different firewall providers. You may also have, um, in the case of bare metal provisioning, if you're doing that in an automated fashion, 
you may want to drop each of these clusters into separate VLANs and provide additional isolation there. Now you're talking about a different network provider as well. So even if you have some unification around some common machine provisioning, if you look at the full cluster management, there really is no kind of standard set that you can use and reuse in other environments. Uh, so we talked a little bit about why the, the current model is too coarse. It's not possible to mix and match portions of providers. So each implementation uh, implements the entirety of the machine and cluster controllers, and it's not possible to switch those uh, components in and out. Um, also, in general, controllers are not universally understood by developers. Um, in a lot of cases, trying to get people to understand how to deal with edge level logic, you know, how to implement the uh, idiosyncrasies of a Kubernetes controller, um, that's a tough, um, you know, kind of learning curve to adopt. So we feel that the synchronous model that webhooks provide may be more familiar to most users, especially the users who are using, you know, interfacing directly with the infrastructure APIs. So another area where uh, controllers may be limited is that they generally have to be implemented in Go. That's where the most complete infrastructure or uh, tooling exists. So you have things like Kube Builder and various controller APIs or frameworks. Uh, one disadvantage of this having to write in Go is that many uh, bare metal provisioning systems right now are not written in Go. So there's an impetus mismatch when you're trying to integrate the cluster API with these external APIs. So as an example, MAZ, which we'll talk about later, is implemented in Python. And their Go language bindings are not ideal. Yep. So basically, what we're trying to say is, you know, the, the picture that we had earlier, we want to turn it more into this, where not only does Cluster API provide for the machine sets and the machine deployments, but it also handles the controller aspects for the clusters and the machines, and the provider implementation doesn't have to adopt part of Cluster API. Instead, it just has to implement the webhook interfaces. And here we're showing the use of QBuilder to provide some of the scaffolding, but that doesn't have to necessarily be uh, the way to go because webhooks are basically just a web server responding to certain requests with certain responses, it would be uh, pretty easy to implement in other languages as well. Okay, so admission webhooks. Uh, we've talked about using webhooks as an extension mechanism, uh, and now we want to briefly talk about admission webhooks since they exist and are relatively more well known. So uh, webhooks are an existing mechanism. Uh, they allow Kubernetes to validate as well as mutate CRDs uh, before they're persisted in etcd. Uh, one advantage of this is uh, this says allow controllers to be develop, developed out of tree, but what this really means is it should say allows webhooks to be, to be developed out of tree. Uh, also, these webhooks can be configured at runtime. So the diagram at the bottom uh, shows an HTTP request that goes to the Kubernetes API server. You see there's authentication and then a number of mutating webhooks are called. Uh, as you proceed through the pipeline, there's object schema validation, and finally, uh, validation of the mutated webhook. At that point, it is persisted in etcd. So uh, I mentioned earlier that you can use a number of different frameworks to create CRDs or webhooks. This is an example from KubeBuilder. So this shows you the scaffolding that KubeBuilder will generate for you when you ask to create a webhook. Uh, the key thing I want to point out here is there is a single line change here that I made, and the rest of this code I did not write. Uh, what this code does is it handles the single uh, request. You can see the object is passed to the handle function. A copy is made. The copy is passed to the mutating function. And then as long as the uh, response is allowed, uh, a patch response is returned. So what is in the patch response? So going, going back, uh, we see that we've made a copy and we passed it to this mutate function. Let's look at the mutate function. It uh, calls the MAZ client to create infrastructure. It then sets a few fields in the copy of the object and it returns them. The interesting thing to note about this slide and the previous slide is that we've referenced no Kubernetes objects uh, and no, nothing really about Kubernetes at all. So you can see that by using the webhook model, you have a, uh, a significant abstraction that makes it easier to write a webhook without understanding the internals of Kubernetes. And at this point, we will do a brief demo showing the webhook model. Uh, 
So this demo is going to use something called MAS. MAS is Metal as a Service. It's developed by Ubuntu. Uh, what it allows you to do is Pixie boot servers and then use CloudInit or SSH to configure those. Um, the images that we Pixie boot are going to be created using Packer as well as a MAS utility. Uh, and then webhooks will be used to uh, boot systems when requested. On the right, we see the CRD for a machine object. And this is the standard CAPI upstream object. Okay. So, so starting now, I'm looking, this is the MAS GUI. This shows you the external API that MAS provides. Uh, we have uh, all of the machines that are available. If you click on one, you can see the attributes that are visible as well as the tags which are settable. So now there are two, so remembering the picture before, uh, we have two parts to this, right? There's the CAPI controllers, and then on the other side of the diagram, we have the webhooks. So I'm gonna show uh, the deployment of these two different components into a kind cluster. So first I'm going to deploy the CRDs. These are the uh, CAPI controllers. You can see it's, it's very simple. We create a kind cluster. We do a make deploy. Make deploy is equivalent to a uh, coup control apply. Uh, we're going to speed this up because we don't want to wait. Kind is fast, but it's not fast enough. Okay. So at this point, all of the CRDs or the controllers have been started. And in a moment here, we're going to proceed with deploying the webhooks. You can see it's, it's very similar. The only difference here is I'm passing a few environment variables in order to tell Maz how to authenticate with the infrastructure when it needs to allocate or deallocate nodes. And this is going to take another minute. So we're oh, this bad request here is because webhooks uh, take some time to start. And so, um, so the next time I, I uh, call the log function, I'll, it will get logs. Okay. All right, so at this point, I paused it. What we have is we've deployed webhooks and we've deployed controllers. Uh, over here, I've catted the cluster manifest to see what I'm doing. Uh, I K apply it. And then I do the same thing for the machine object. When I do that, you can see in the bottom screen that we have created a machine. And the interesting thing here is the machine has a provider ID, which is this string of characters, as well as an IP address. Now, I can't ping the machine immediately. Uh, remember, what Maz does is it uh, deploys a pre-built image using Pixie Boot, and it takes time to boot. So here's my node, and you can see that it's currently deploying. Okay, and so then the last part I wanna show is, you can see here what we, we, the webhook has been called, I described the machine object again, and you can see that now we have uh, these characters here. So the provider ID was filled in by the webhook. That happened when the patch response was returned. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's the entirety of the demo, just trying to show that uh, A, it's easy to deploy these two components with a single kube apply each, uh, and then that it's possible to link them so that the controller calls the webhook, obtains a machine with an identifier and an IP address. So going back, so, so what are the problems with admission webhooks? Uh, so first, uh, you can't inject data before the webhook is called. The webhook is called by Kubernetes and not by the controller itself. Um, webhooks have some limitations in that they, they must be item potent. So controllers must be item potent. Uh, but that's sort of built into learning how to write a controller. Webhooks don't have that same sort of expectation, I think, from a developer perspective. Uh, the reason they need to be unimportant is if a webhook should fail after it allocates a machine, you may need to clean that up later uh, through some sort of garbage collection process. Um, you're not able to set status from the admission webhook. That's 
you can work around it by giving yourself proper RBAC permissions, but it's generally, uh, it's not the uh, normal way that webhooks are used today. Uh, and the final thing is the webhooks are relatively new, only a year or two old. And so there's still, uh, just as controllers are well, not well known, webhooks within the Kubernetes communities not, may not be as well known. So that brings us to custom webhooks. All right, so one of the things we think we can solve with custom webhooks is um, make them not limited to the admission webhook re requests and response types. So for each of the webhooks that we define, we can actually have specific requests and response types that are tightly scoped to the actions that we're taking. So you could take very specific fields for input into the machine creation and then provide specific responses back that can then be later used during later stages. Um, they're also, it, instead of being initiated by the admission controller, they would be initiated by the common controllers run by Cluster API itself. So we don't have some of the issues around status like we do today. Um, the status can easily be uh, introspected and, and changed directly as part of this because it wouldn't be the webhook that's actually updating the status or the object. It would be the common controller updating it based on the response from the webhook. And we can ensure better consistency of the uh, cluster API controller interfaces for the end user. So each of the different provider implementations behave a lot, a lot more like each other rather than being completely distinct and separate experiences as they are today. So with that, one of the things we actually ran into as we started uh, going down this path was we didn't anticipate that the cluster API project itself was going to take on, um, one, they weren't going to publish V1 Alpha 1 as quickly as we ended up doing, and then additionally, we didn't expect that we were going to already have discussions talking about what V1 Alpha 2 is going to look like and how are we going to change the API to fit the limitations of cluster API as it sits today. So part of those discussions have led to um, you know, some of the same conclusions that we already did as we started imp trying to implement this model. The first one, separation of bootstrap from infrastructure provider implementations. That is something that's definitely on the table for the next iteration of cluster API. Um, no more, you won't have the situation anymore where each of the providers implement their own bootstrapping mechanism. That should be consumed separately from the infrastructure providers. Um, the other thing that we have is uh, we've agreed that there should be some type of control plane management. So today, each of the providers has to do its own differentiation of whether a particular machine is supposed to be part of the control plane or if it's supposed to be a worker node. That leads to a lot of replicated logic on how do you handle each of those two things. And even for kubeadm based implementations, which is what the majority of the provider implementations are today, um, each of those has to replicate the exact same management of how do they differentiate between control plane and worker and do the right thing. Um, and on top of that, you can't leverage some of the higher level concepts that you, have, that you have in cluster API today, like machine sets and machine deployments, because they don't have the logic of how do you properly handle a control plane node. You know, how do you properly delete a machine from etcd after that machine's been deleted? Um, so the control plane management, the intent there is to be able to handle those use cases and be able to gracefully scale up, scale down, create and destroy control planes for clusters. Um, we've also decided that there's going to be some type of unified image building. So for today, if you're running the uh, vSphere provider, for example, there's a different tool to create uh, base images for those uh, clusters. Now, it also creates a base image that doesn't have the kubelet and some of the other required components, whereas if you look at the AWS provider, um, we have an image building tool that includes all of those things. So it's more of a golden image. So we're gonna unify that, we wanna unify that experience across various different providers and know that for a given provider, a given base image looks a particular way. Uh, additionally, uh, we didn't really talk about this today, but uh, for the data model, with the current model, how you specify provider-specific configuration is basically by taking a raw blob of YAML or JSON and embedding it in the cluster of the machine object. 
um, that will be going away in the next iteration uh, for a few different reasons. One of them is it's very difficult to validate the, an embedded raw object in a Kubernetes object. The common controller has no idea, you know, what that content is. And even if you wanted to provide validation via an admission webhook, you would have to take the cluster of the machine object, decode the embedded provider config, and then only then could you actually do the validation. So by moving that config to a top level CRD, there's a better way to do that validation at admission time and provide a better experience to the end user. So instead of having to troll through the controller logs to see that you misconfigured your provider specific information, you would get that information directly back you know, once you tried to submit it to the cluster. And then finally, for the topic that you know, we're here today to discuss, the extension mechanism, there is no consensus in the community yet, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, there are basically two different factions. One of them um, you know, believes very heavily in independent controllers. So sort of similar to the model we have today, except taking more to an extreme where each provider would actually have its own independent controller in charge of reconciling its own CRDs. And then there's also another proposal out there for a webhook-based implementation very similar to uh, what we've explored and what we talked about today. But at the end of the day, you know, I can't really tell you what the future is gonna look like. It may be the independent controllers, it may be the webhooks, or it may be a combination of both. Because I think what we wanna do as we continue to explore this is weigh the benefits and the drawbacks of each of the different approaches and try to find the best approach, not necessarily for a single extension mechanism for the project as a whole, but the right extension mechanism for the particular extension point that we're talking about. So to give an example, you know, in some cases, you know, maybe it makes sense to have the machine controller be an independent, or the machine reconciliation handled by an independent controller, because one of the things that could happen is, is when you're dealing with bare metal environments, some of that provisioning could take time, like we saw with Maz. That could lead to potential timeouts with the webhook, and you know, some of the reentrancy issues that you have to handle for that, for retries, and, and how do you handle that properly. Um, maybe an independent controller makes a lot of sense there, but other things, if we're talking about providing for the provisioning mechanism and the uh, bootstrapping code in particular, um, does it make sense to have an independent controller that just watches for a request to output some data that could be used to feed into CloudInit for um, instance creation? An independent controller and waiting on that may be a little heavyweight and the webhook model might fit in there. So hopefully over the course of the next month, hopefully not much longer than that, we'll have a better clear view of um, where we're gonna go for the next iteration of Cluster API. I just wanna highlight a point that Jason just made. Um, currently, Kubernetes is extensible using both CRDs and webhooks, right? So those are the two Kubernetes extension mechanisms. I think it is highly likely that the Cluster API will utilize both. We know that it currently uses C CRDs, and really there's no way to avoid using CRDs if you wanna extend Kubernetes, uh, except for the admission webhooks that exist right now. And then I think that webhooks, they provide uh, the, the ability to extend Kubernetes without uh, the, um, well, with a number of trade-offs, like not having to expose the internal configuration to the user, right? All CRDs are potentially user visible, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think they, they're both valid extension mechanisms, and it's likely both will be used. So we've also provided a few different resources uh, the first two relate specifically to the demo that David showed. Uh, the first one is the generic cluster API provider, where that just implements the current uh, cluster API provider actuator interface. And then the second one is the actual uh, MAS webhook. And then also we have cluster API office hours weekly on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. U.S. Pacific time. Uh, if this uh, topic is of interest of you and uh, is of interest to you and you want to help us further the conversation, please go ahead and join those join that meeting. And with that, uh, if we have any time, uh, yeah. we'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Yes.
It's currently actually implemented for more clouds than it is for bare metal. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, uh, is the cluster API focused on bare metal, or does it also support other clouds? Uh, actually, the cluster API supports more clouds right now than it does bare metal. Bare metal, I think, is one of the hardest areas because of the diversity of uh, approaches. Whereas clouds tend to provide uniform APIs, they make it, they facilitate uh, creating providers. Uh, I, I would also add that while the primary focus of most of the contributors is to enable cluster creation on various cloud providers, um, myself, David, and quite a few other contributors also have a lot of vested interest in making sure that whatever we provide with Cluster API is also applicable to those bare metal and other types of on-premise environments. Yeah, in many ways, I think bare metal is sort of the final frontier when it comes to cluster deployment. Uh, we've been doing clouds for a while. They're relatively well known, but uh, I'm not aware of very many popular bare metal solutions. All right, well, thank you for your time. Thank you very much.